Food is important not just to sustain life, but in how it can connect us to our traditions and other people. Some Native Americans are seeking out foods that their ancestors ate in an effort to improve their health and reconnect with their culture. Correspondent Megan Kamrick sat down earlier this fall with an editor of the Pueblo Food Experience Cookbook and a local chef. They talked about recipes that appeal to adults and kids and why food traditions are important for communities. Thank you for joining us on New Mexico in Focus. I have Roxanne Swenzel. She's the author of The Pueblo Food Experience, Whole Food of Our Ancestors. And Lois Ellen Frank, she's a scholar, author, and chef. And I want to talk with you both about returning to native foods. Roxanne, for nearly three years, almost four years, mm -hmm. you have eaten only or mostly food eaten by your ancestors before European contact. Why did you want to do this and how difficult was it? Um, I wanted to do it by way of um, um, trying to keep our native crops alive because I've been a seed saver for over 30 years. And it was one way to try to bring back the actual crops back into the culture and to um, find out if it's possible in today's time. Um, also because of the health issues we find in the, the Pueblos, um, in all the tribes at this point, and seeing what it would do to us physically to eat our ancestral foods only. So we did a trial test for three months and tested uh, 14 volunteers for three months, um, got physicals, blood tests and stuff to see what eating only a pre-contact diet would do to us. And the results were incredible. Really? Incredible. Improved health outcomes, blood pressure, yeah. weight loss? Yeah, and mental clarity. I mean, it was, everybody got healthier in all ways. What was that like for you to experience that? Um, more than a diet, <laughs> more than health. It was a very spiritual journey into getting um, reconnected to our culture and place. Um, there's, I was thinking at the time that, wow, this, I didn't know food would be the journey that would lead us um, closer than I've ever been to what I believe our ancestors um, were holding. Lois, you are also working in the space, have been for 25 years, writing, educating, teaching people how to cook. What, what was your journey? How did it begin? And did you have similar kinds of experiences when? I, I, th I think we're a lot aligned. Um, my journey was a little different as a professional chef uh, and being classically trained. What I noticed was that there were no native people in commercial kitchens, very few women. And uh, in culinary schools, they were teaching sh up and coming chefs that native people didn't make a contribution, that American cuisine wasn't half native, mm -hmm. if not more. And so I think the journey started a little differently mm -hmm. than Roxanne's journey. But uh, as I began to research what are native foods, what do we all have in common, um, how did we trade? for thousands of years, uh, what were those foods, and, and really breaking it down into, the, into a historic continuum from the pre-contact to the first contact to the government issue to now. And what You're talking I, about government issued commodities. I'm talking about relocation. My mm -hmm. tribe was relocated. Uh, what is your tribe? Kiowa. Mm -hmm. So forced relocation. We went from bison culture to Oklahoma and the government giving us seeds and saying plant. And while that's something we can learn, um, it wasn't inherently who we were. And uh, this disruption um, with food and the, the knowledge surrounding food and land um, it is very um, difficult in terms of a history of Native people and their foods. And you know, we have 566 federally recognized tribes. Every single one of them knows how to make fry bread. So the government succeeded. Right, mm -hmm. the government succeeded. That doesn't include state-recognized tribes, and you they know, succeeded because that's white flour and lard. White flour and lard, pretty much the worst kinds of and things sugar. you could eat, <laughs> or sugar on top, mm -hmm. or the base for an Indian taco. And um, where we are now is what I'm calling the new native, and the new native American cuisine is going back to the future. We go back in history to move forward. We reclaim what is ours. We tell it in our own voice. Mm. 
we teach young culinary students how to be native chefs and cook their native foods in every restaurant, every, every gaming facility, all over the world. And, and we encourage other cultures to do the same thing. Talk about the kinds of foods where, you know, you, you went to, back to these pre-contact foods. What are they? We have this lovely display here. What are some of these pre-contact foods? What are we talking about? Basically, it is what was in our environment at that time. Um, I, could, I could give you a rough idea of like the elk, deer, rabbit, buffalo, fish that was here, different birds, different rodents, insects, <laughs> and then the crops that were grown, corn. basically corn, beans, and squash. Amaranth is a one that we forget, but that was very much prominent in this area at that time. And um, um, then all the wild herbs and, and stuff that we were, we were picking, roots, nuts. I want to ask you about, you made a trail mix. I made a trail mix. And what does mix. that have in it? One of the, the staples of when we were going into this diet and we couldn't eat any outside food, um, we were used to fast, fast uh, lifestyle and snack food. And so we had to think of things that we could eat on the, on the road and um, that were also kind of sweet because we were all going through detox, mostly of sugar. And uh, one of the things that we came up with was this trail mix, which is made out of uh, pumpkin seeds and currants. And you could add sunflowers or sunflower seed or pinion nuts. That's a nice addition to it. And it's just a nice um, snack food. Lois, I know that you incorporate um, contemporary foods in with native foods, like you have a blue corn mush, but then you also had a berry compote. What is the result of combining native foods and traditions with maybe more contemporary foods? Uh, what, what is the benefit? I think as a chef, you know, uh, what we're doing is we're taking European culinary techniques in a modern kitchen. Um, a good example would be, do I know how to grind corn on the grinding stones that have been in my family for generations? Yes. Do I do that every day for all of the foods? No, we have modern uh, machines and Cuisinous, appliances, Cuisinart, <laughs> a food grinder. So uh, I incorporate some of the modern techniques for using food. And then the presentation. I think as Native people, we've always been artists. And we see that in this beautiful pot. We see it in the, the jewel-like colors of our corn. We see it in the way we dress. We see it in everything. And it's also in our food. And so how we present it, how we design it is also art. We used to paint our ponies when we would ride, our, you know, our warriors to go hunting. We used to paint all of our potteries and design our beautiful regalia. And that we can do that same thing with food. So I think as a contemporary chef, what I'm doing is I'm bringing in that artistic element and encouraging my students to do the same thing. All of us can have the same recipe. How, what we do with it makes us each our individual artists. And so, you know, the trail mix, um, Roxanne's doing it one way. I might say, ooh, well, what other wild berries could I add? And, yeah. You know, this, it's the same thing. We're just doing it a little differently. And Roxanne, uh, you also had some very familiar recipes like blue corn pancakes in your book. Mm -hmm. You also had things like fried grasshoppers. Yes. And were those tasty? <laughs> <laughs> they are tasty if you cook them right. And okay. if you catch them when they're, they're young. When they get a little big, they get chewy. Their mm -hmm. legs are a little chewy. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm willing to try. <laughs> Did you give up chili? Yes. Chile was not here when the Spanish arrived. The Spanish brought it up through Mexico. And so we had to go off of basic things that we thought were <laughs> into our, our traditions, like chili, like fry bread, like coffee, like coffee um, alcohol, you know, all those Mm -hmm. Those things, no. Now, have you, are, you, are you still on that strict? Uh, I'm not as strict as that second? first part because we were guinea pigs. We wanted to mm -hmm. see scientifically what it was doing uh, med medically, what it did to our bodies. So during that first three months, we were very strict. Um, and then some of us stayed on pretty hardcore for as long as we could, and we can't go on and off. Depending on, you know, when you're traveling, it's hard to find these foods. Um, but... Um, you know, for me, I, if possible, I eat this way all the time. You've both taught uh, children 
about native foods, taught them how to cook it. What has been their reaction? I'm thinking the kid is like, I could have a fried grasshopper or a Twinkie. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we do a, a Native American a kids camp and mm -hmm. we work on a curriculum, we're writing the curriculum right now with the Santa Fe Public Schools for Indian Education and um, we teach children as young as five how to cut vegetables and make stew and uh, grind corn and um, how to make mush, how to boil the berries to make it into a dessert. Are they into it? They love it. Hmm. Um, I think what happens is when you create a pride in the foods that are traditional um, and uh, you teach skills, children grow up uh, learning, you know, and you know you're a success when um, kids say, I have to save this, I have to save this, can I, can I have another one, can I save it? I have to show my mom, and then when mom comes to pick them up, they run and they're like, mama, mama, look, we made this pudding, it's a Native American parfait, it's corn mush <laughs> with berries, and you know, we're doing the same thing as what they would see, you know, a yogurt parfait, but we didn't have yogurt. We didn't, I mean, if you want to think you could milk a wild elk to get <laughs> cheese or butter or, you know, I, I wouldn't it didn't happen. That. We didn't milk bison. We didn't have dairy. And so, you know, when we see all these commercials that say, you know, you need um, yogurt for probiotics, well, for 9,500 years, what did Native people do? And we used our Native foods. And so, you know, we bring that in. We bring the stories. We bring the, the foods. And I think kids are sponges, and I think uh, mm -hmm. they, it, it, it's an amazing process. Did they like yeah. the grasshoppers? <laughs> Some will go, eh. <laughs> but, See, yeah. We, you know, we can't go back to pre-conquest world or time. Um, so how do you hope that incorporating these foods into our diet now can help us in this modern world? Um, you know, we obviously live in the modern age now, but we can eat this way. So, um, in a way, we can go back. <laughs> but with a consciousness, with a conscious choice to do that, because it is a reconnecting to place and culture. And it doesn't mean everyone should eat this way. I believe, you know, I know everyone's indigenous to somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's more asking the question, where are you from originally on this earth? What did your body adapt to food-wise because of that environment you come from? And it, there's a connection that happens. Um, I'd love Lois to just tell that story she just told me before we came in here about, about her going to Russia and that connection to food. I know you just came back from Russia and why, tell me about that real quick. Fine. Um, so I do what's called culinary diplomacy, uh, diplomacy through food. And um, we did ship many ingredients from here. So for the Russians, they had uh, white cornbread from uh, Santa Ana Pueblo and blue cornbread and uh, blue corn pasole, red corn pasole, white corn pasole, a tamale. We had to teach them not to eat the outside, uh, <laughs> corn, the corn husk. husk. But um, I think the biggest message, there, there's two sort of themes that come up is, one, food is a universal language, and we're, we are all indigenous to somewhere. And um, as they tasted the food, you know, one of them was the boiled berries, and it, it boils, and the pectin in the berries makes it uh, almost gelatinous, it, it hardens. And one of the young culinary students said, my grandma could have made this, but we would have served it with sour cream. So they're definitely a dairy culture. And, um, you know, the message is that, uh, what did your grandmother make? And, and what did she nourish you with? And how do you reclaim that? So when someone goes to a place, and Roxanne is right, it's place-based, instead of trying to eat another world cuisine or another culture's cuisine, what is your cuisine? Who are you? And what did your ancestors cook? And I know when I travel, that's what I want to eat. People come to New Mexico for the cultural experience, and they want to eat the foods of this place. Why would you want to eat a Maryland crab cake in New Mexico? <laughs> You'd want to go to Maryland to eat that. So here, what do we have and what can we share that's inherently indigenous? And I think people want that. People are ready for the first time in history. Well, thank you so much for coming and talking. This has been great. Thank and you for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you.